If you have your Bible with you, turn to Matthew chapter 9. If you don't have your Bible, there should be one in back of the pew in front of you. Matthew chapter 9. Ricardo dropped the ball. I mean, it was one play, one pass, one call, and I, actually he didn't drop it, but the Seattle Seahawks offensive coordinator said that he should have done a better job staying strong on it. And with second and goal on the one-yard line and certain Super Bowl history and victory within their grasp, the Seahawks coach, Pete Carroll, called for a pass in the crowded middle. And, and the throw was right on target, but Seahawks fans watched in disbelief as, as what transpired will live now in the annals of the NFL as long as American football is played. And the sure-handed receiver spotted the ball, reached out, and, and he retched out. And with just 20 seconds left in the game, the only thing between him and football fame was a New England Patriots spare part. A player who was not drafted, he was not even signed after to a contract after the draft, the rookie cornerback, Malcolm Butler. Seattle had, had, three, had a timeout left, three plays to try and win the game. But Butler, he dug inside Lockett. He captured the catch, deflated ball that it was. He made his first career interception, and the New England cheaters took a knee in the ensuing play after the Seah Seahawks lost their chance at Super Bowl heaven. And you know, most people remember the plays that were made and the passes that were caught, like the, like the one that got them down to the five-yard line just a couple of plays before, but Seahawks fans only remember the one that was intercepted. And I don't see why you're not getting this, because somebody listening to me right now is nursing and cursing and rehearsing the memory of some ball you dropped, some game you lost, some fame you forfeited somewhere in your life. But since you're not yet feeling me like I need you to, can I give you an experiential exegesis of drop balls? Can I exegete your experience for an explanation as to why we all have such a hard time in getting free from guilt after we've dropped the ball and moving forward without regret? See, first off, notice if you will, this is number one, drop balls happen to us all. There's some spot you failed, something you overlooked, some child you neglected, some, some item you didn't complete, some relationship that fell apart because of some apology you didn't offer, some communication you didn't make, some, some conversation you didn't initiate, or some addiction you didn't stop. And then on the other hand, and this is number two, memories of drop balls fade very slowly. What would, what would an x-ray of your soul reveal buried inside? Regrets over a past relationship, remorse over a poor choice, shame about the marriage that ended or the habit that did not, the temptation you did not resist, the courage you could not find. One of those toxic foreign objects that gets buried inside of us is guilt, and guilt lies hidden and festering and irritating us and sometimes so deeply embedded we don't even remember how it got there. So in the final analysis, this is number three. Guilt and regret can immobilize your life, holding so much power over you, you are paralyzed and cannot move forward in the eternal purpose of God. Let me illustrate that irrefutable idea because formerly known as Saul, a prominent Jewish Pharisee, before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul compelled Christians to curse God by speaking against Jesus Christ. He was the chief persecutor in an effort of the Jews to eradicate that fledgling way called Christianity. Years after his conversion and after all his missionary trips, Paul writes to his pastoral protege Timothy, and he reflects on his life before Christ and some of the guilt that he had. And he says, what I personally find for me is the most comforting verse in the Bible, and that's in 1 Timothy, you can see it on your handout, 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 and 13, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. He says, I was not able, but his exceeding abundant grace enabled me. I was unfaithful, 
But his mercy counted me faithful when I was not. And with faith and love, he put me, a former blasphemer, that means I wounded people, abusing them with my words, and a former persecutor, that means I hurt people, abusing them with my actions. He put me into the ministry to save sinners of whom I am chief. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. Look, Alan, I don't know who told you I was going to be here today, and I don't know how. You know that I've struggled with the belief that I've wasted a lot of my life. I have regrets. I feel guilt. I was blessed with more talent than wisdom. I made more enemies than I made money, and consequently my life ought to be a hit country song right now. I mean, I ruined my marriage, angry children, broken health, wasted money. I'm sure my liver looks like it's been soaked in whiskey. And if I were honest, I would admit that was a lot of the problem right there. I mean, I feel like my past is pursuing me like a posse. So don't let me leave here till you show me. How can I get free from my guilt? God gave me a wife. I wore her down and finally drove her off. God gave me kids to raise and I blew it. God gave me a good job and nothing but my pride led me to leave it. Can God ever forgive me? I'd be glad to help you out. Give me a minute to unpack our passage. We'll clothe ourselves with his truth, get our healing, and head out of here ready to bring somebody with us next Sunday to get a complete camp experience and hear, uh, you know, and watch our baptisms, uh, uh, listen to Wayburn Dean, and hear one of our camp speakers. So let me take you to our text, because here's our thesis for today's study. Shame and worry often dominate the days of those who have not allowed God's forgiveness to free them from their guilt. Shame over their sin, worry about their consequences, regret for what could have been, disgrace over what was. We feel no presence of God, no access to mercy, no possibility of pardon. Orphans, unprotected and exposed. Heaven must be removed from our eternal destiny. So that is a line of logic that the devil loves. But the Lord contradicts and the Bible corrects. Guilt, remorse, and regret are all emotions that not only have teeth, they also have bite. And yet here's our first point for study. While, while guilt has fangs, God has forceps. So in the first New Testament reference to cheer and being cheerful, Jesus gives guilt a root canal. Watch. Matthew chapter 9, begin with me in verse 1. <clears throat> And Jesus entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. That would be the coastal Galilean city of Capernaum, Capernaum, city of Nahum, city of comfort. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their face, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, don't miss that because Jesus places cheerfulness and forgiveness in the same verse as physical healing. Because health begins when your sin gets handled. Sin has to get handled for you to really have health. So the capacity to live cheerfully and dynamically and heroically and righteously begins with the reality your sins have been forgiven. And Jesus spoke these words to a man who could not move himself. He suffered some disease that he contracted while he was involved in sin. I don't know if it was straight sin or gay sin, but, but he was not cheerful now. And, and if it was same-sex lust, then he discovered how his transgender temptations deceived him because no matter who he lusted after or how he felt about who he was, and even though the Romans said gender was simply a social construct you could ignore, he could not change from one sex into another. I thought he was born that way till he finally recognized you can't do it that way and get a natural birth. So, so whatever flavor, the sin that he savored, he contracted something that sidelined him. An infantile paralysis made him a broken adult, a crippled man lying on a mat. His mind was giving instructions. His body refused to obey. But before you judge him too harshly, how many times have you made a decision in your head that your body did not obey? How many times have you made a promise in your heart and then broke it? And that is the deeper point today. He would not have been flat on that bed if his stuff was working. And all his stuff would have been working except for his sin. So as you examine your own life, 
I want you to ask, what friendships, what relationships, what systems or structures are you putting in place to prop up the stuff you know is not working? Because whatever they are, that is your bed. The beds we lay on comfort us in our wrong, but they do not comfort, confront us over our wrong. So, we, so consequently, we end up thinking, you know, I don't have to be a wife. I, I can settle in the bed of being a side piece. I mean, I don't need to marry her because we can settle in the bed, a common law relationship. And it's not that you don't have money, you just settle in the bed and mismanaging money. You are where you are in your life because you keep making excuses for your life. Hello, somebody. And don't, you don't need to say amen. I don't need your help to preach today. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to, no, you need to go to one of those churches where the preacher needs some help. You make excuses instead of making time to get discipled. You make excuses instead of making time to take an institute class. You make excuses instead of making better friends in our men's ministry, in our ladies' fellowships. You made your bed, now you're lying in it, refusing to consider the souls you could have won, the lives you could have changed, and the glory that God would have been given. You could have already been serving God. You could have already been knowing your Bible. You could have already been healing other people's diseases by showing the grace of God, pointing them to faith in God, and letting the Word of God do the work in their life. People can come to, to, to church and never yet, yet never be changed in church or by the church because they're making it on their mat. They're locked into laying up on their couch. They are painted on that pew. But you better recognize, and this is our second point for study, anytime you have everything you need in order to function and yet you do not function, that is dysfunction. But this is function junction today. So everything you claim to relate to, you need to biblically function in. Either function as a father or you're paralyzed. Either function as a wife or you're paralyzed. If you are not functioning biblically, then you are dysfunctional until you function. Am I talking too fast today? God will not bless you in any area. You're not functional. So this is the Sunday to start your function. How much, how much better off would you be if you were really functional in fulfilling all the titles that you wear, all the roles that you have, all the relationships that you claim, all the people you say you love and, and the life you say you want to live and the place you want to say you want to serve. See, that's why nobody respects you. They can't respect you if you're not connected to God's eternal purpose. So don't become a husband if you still want to fool around. Don't become a wife if you still want to act single. Don't, don't make a baby if you don't want a parent. You are at church today, so meet Jesus and become unparalyzed. And don't, don't, don't join the team if you just want to criticize it, because here's our third point for study. All your complaints or excuses are just part of your mat ministry designed to deliver you from the need to change. This brother, he did nothing but lay in the bed he made, allowing other people to carry his weight. Where's James Brown when you need him? Because you need to get up off of that thing. <laughs> but fortunately, not only did this brother have a bed, he also had companions who brought him to church that day. Look at verse 2. And behold, they brought, him to, brought to Jesus a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith. Okay, you missed that, so let me be kind and rewind. They, they've been trying to get this brother off the mat for 27 years. And finally, they realize the only hope of getting you off your mat and getting you free from guilt is getting you there to Jesus. So you used up your savings, you ran up your debt, you ruined your family and alienated your friends trying to help somebody who was on the couch that didn't want to get up off of that couch. So you're messing up your life because they are consecrated to wallowing in the, on their couch. So stop trying to rescue them and bring them to Jesus. 
See, the other gospel accounts tell us that there were four of these men who load their friend up into a handicapped van and bring him to see this carpenter in Capernaum. And it was by the time they got there, because you know somebody else parked in a handicapped spot, and, and so his standing room only, the place was packed. People, people are sitting on the windowsill. They are crowded around the door frame because Jesus is in the house. And this is our fourth point for study. We're ultimately defined by our responses to the obstacles in our life. So when they could not get in the door, being the kind of friends who don't give up, they concocted a plan. They examined the walls. They said, ah, too thick. But they looked up at the roof and said, huh, all we need is some rope. I mean, others believed it was impossible, but in, in Mark's account, Mark chapter 2, verse 4, we put on your handout, it says, when they could not come nigh unto Jesus for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. That was the faith Jesus saw. And whenever you give a faith response to the obstacles in life, that determines how your story is going to end. So this fraternity of friends, they broke the rules. They went outside the box. They broke the box. They defied all expectation because they were tenacious enough to tear up those tiles. They were creative enough to climb. And I know you got a lot of people in your life, but you need at least four break-the-roof people in your life. They broke all the rules by association, by identification, and without hesitation. They stepped into his situation, and there's no indication that this man was anything but a skeptic. But that didn't matter none, because Jesus saw the faith of the four friends. And that is what we take with us as we go across I-70 and we do our outreach August on Wednesday nights. Next month, meet us at 6 on August 5th. Six on August 5th, because we're going out to paralyze people. And the reason we're going out to paralyze people is not because they believe in Jesus, but because we do. Because we do, and we are not content to leave anybody without a witness on their mat. And here's one area that you got to give this man props, because at least he did not connect with four other paralyzed dudes. I mean, a lot of people won't hang out with somebody better than them and stronger than them and further along than they are, but he did. And it will be your strength that shakes those people that we're trying to reach in their weakness. Your strength will shake them in their weakness. Shaman Aloranda should have bought a Honda. I mean, I don't believe speaking in tongues is for today, but if I did, are you still hanging with people who are dysfunctional as you? I mean, if everybody around you is on the same level as you, then you need discipleship, baby. And you always need somebody who's further or been at it longer or on a higher plane so that you can see what Christ's likeness looks like. So surround yourself with the people who are doing what you've never yet attempted because that is going to help you get to where you've never yet gone. Help me, Holy Spirit. Because you cannot be so insecure that everybody around you got to be struggling worse than you. This was a risky strategy. Climb over a wall, tear up this tile. I mean, homeowners generally don't like to have their roofs disassembled. And most paraplegics are not fond of a one-way bungee drop from the ceiling. And, and most teachers don't appreciate the a spectacle in the middle of their lesson. But these four friends did it anyway. Are you an anyway believer? That's what we're taking to camp with us, anyway believers. That's, that's what we'll have Wednesday nights, going across I-70, meet at, meet at American Inn, anyway believers. And watch, the faith of this par par paralytics friends is in stark contrast to the Jewish legal scholars. Watch, verse 3, and behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves. They said within themselves, but you know, Jesus always had a special connection with them because they were the leaders, the rulers who were supposed to approve him as the Messiah. And so when they said within themselves, this man blasphemeth, Jesus knew their thoughts and said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? I mean, that should have been some type of message right there. Whoa, he knows what I'm thinking in my heart. But these Pharisees didn't act like the four friends because they had no faith in Jesus. 
So we do not know the reaction of the homeowner. We do not see the expression on the face of the man on the mat. But all we know is Jesus did not object. And Matthew all but paints a smile on his face. Why? Because here's our fifth point for study. Jesus issued forgiveness before it was even requested. And 1 John 2, 2 says that, that Jesus Christ the righteous is the propitiation for our sins, the payment for God's, the satisfaction for God's offended justice. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of everybody on the other side I-70, for the sins of the whole world. And the whole world hasn't asked for it yet because the whole world doesn't know that gospel yet. And some who do hear it don't believe it, but they can. Some who do won't, but they could. They can because Jesus issued forgiveness even before it was requested. He issues forgiveness before it's requested, and he gives a freedom from guilt no one is expecting. I mean, they thought, if anything, well, maybe he'll just heal the guy. No, he didn't even start there. This man is paralyzed. You would expect Jesus to say, like verse 5 says, for whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven, or to say, arise and walk. I mean, you'd expect him to say, arise and enter the next 10K. Instead, he offers this man mercy, not a, not a miracle for his muscle. And the miracle in his muscles was only proof of the mercy from the Messiah. Why did Jesus do that? Because he was thinking about our deepest problem, and this is our sixth point for study. Our deepest problem is never what we're in. Our deepest problem is always unpardoned sin. Sin is like radiation. It has fallout. So Jesus considered our deepest problem, and before healing the man's body, he treated his soul, verse 6, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to, to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed. I mean, to, in order to prove he had power to pardon sins, he said, Look, man, get this mat out of my way. You're, I'm tripping over your bed. Get, get the bed out of here. And, and put those tiles back on the roof while you're at it. And it's subtle, but you've got to see this before you go, because it plays into how we will effectively witness during Outreach August. Jesus is the only person in this story to address that man based on his position and not his condition. I mean, everybody else only saw his condition. They called him crip, broke, special needs, limited capacity, afflicted. Jesus steps up in the box and, and look at what he says, verse 2. Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Son is not his condition right now, but it is his position as a child of Abraham. Oh, son is not his state, but it is his standing as a child of God. Son, you're broken, you're busted, you're disgusted. I know you're dysfunctional right now, but you're still my son. So that means successful witnessing is simply getting people to see just three things. First, letter A, our deepest problem is unpardoned sin. But, letter B, Jesus has issued forgiveness even before you requested it. So letter C, become a child of God by faith in Jesus, and your position will start to override your condition. Sham and Alaranda should have bought a hunt. I'm just saying, sin is to disregard God and disregard his word. So if now you start regarding his word and regarding his presence and, and intervention in your activity, then your, your position will start to override your condition. And as long as you walk in the spirit, he will walk you out of whatever you are in. That is the hope we take to outreach August. So let me hit you with this definition, because sin is godless living. S centering your life on the middle letter in the word S-I-N. So there is an I-N team. It's just stuck up in the A-hole. It's all about me. I have to be happy. I need to feel good. You're not making me feel like I need to feel. Why you keep babbling on about the King James Bible? Well, because I'm not about to shout. I'm about you embracing the truth, even though you don't believe it exists. Because if you embrace the truth, it will take you the rest of the way. The sinner's life is self-focused, and that's part of the problem that they're in. 
The reason they cannot get free is because they are self-focused, because self is simply flesh spelled backwards with the eights knocked off. So the snake came slithering, and he offered a better idea. He said, yea, hath God said, God's word is not really true. Go ahead and eat from the tree, because if you will eat from the tree, you will evolve. It's the scientific thing to do. All, all, the, all, the, all the really smart people accept this. You will evolve and turn into your own God if you'll just eat of the tree. And just like that, guilt entered the human race because we were guilty of sin. Suppose Adam and Eve had defied the devil and answered a different way. Suppose they refused to give soil to the serpent's seeds of doubt about God's word. Suppose they said, you wrong, reptile. Go work for Geico, gecko. You can't make us doubt him. We know too much about him. So crawl back in that hole you came out of. Instead, their sin did them in when they stopped trusting God. They took matters and fruit into their own hands so they could evolve into their own God. They, and then they did what guilty people do. They, they went and hid. Temptation mismanaged always leads to sin. Sin mismanaged always leads to guilt. Guilt mismanaged always leads to hiding, just like David said. Psalm 32, beginning verse 3, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I'll confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah, Selah means stop and think about that, Satan. When I hid my sin, it was a living death. When I confessed my sin, I got forgiveness. And I was set free from guilt when I got forgiveness. Adam was the first sinner because he lived as if his creator and his master did not exist. So I want you to tether your heart to this promise in Psalm 32 and tie the knot, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile, and no guile means you're not deceptively hiding your sin or acting like you're really repentant when you're not. And emotions don't get a vote, only the Bible does. So can, can I go ahead and give you, just before we raise up out of here, how to get free to live a guilt-free life. Anybody want to hear this? Just say, hit it hard in the pain, Alan. I'll even take silence as consent because, you know, I always keep it 100 on, on Sundays. So first off, notice, if you will, to get free from guilt. This is number one. Embrace grace. Let the whole church say embrace it. Those who feel guilty, stifled by regret, are those who have not fully accepted God's grace. You know why you're suffering the awful effects of guilt? Because our sin stays with us until we embrace grace. Romans 3, verse 24. Verse 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But don't stop there. Because all those who are believers by being born again are being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So to get free from guilt, embrace grace. But then second, second, this is number two, model mercy. Let the whole church say model it. Those who embrace grace are made a billboard to the world to mirror God's mercy with jeans on. You know, if you get in a tragic accident, it's going to take you months or even years to recover and maybe never fully recover, the social workers in the hospitals will always bring in a survivor. They'll bring in another amputee or a burn victim or an accident survivor to show you that life will go on. When you embrace God's grace, your life becomes an example of God's mercy. And whenever you're t tempted to go back into bondage to guilt and to regret, God's mercy is going to keep you on track with God's eternal purpose. So in the final analysis, to get free from guilt, and this is number three, go with the gospel. Oh, your sin was great, but the gospel is greater. Because the good news of the gospel yields grace, mercy, and peace. Nothing frees you from guilt like a clear grasp of God's grace. And nothing prevents you from embracing grace except in ignorance 
of God's mercy. So if you have not yet accepted God's forgiveness, you are doomed to guilty fear. Nothing can deliver you from fear of death, fear of hell. No pill, no pep talk, no possession can set the sinner's heart at ease. You may deaden it with drugs, but you cannot remove it. Go ahead and stand and grab your neighbor by the hand. Have you accepted the forgiveness that God offers in Jesus Christ? Because it is his finished work on the cross that allows God's grace to operate on your behalf. It is forgiveness offered before it's even requested. And so now the Bible states in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't you want to be clean today? You say, Alan, but I know me. I know I'm just going to go out here and, and get dirty again. Yeah, but at least you won't be a pig anymore. We all get dirty again, but get born again and you won't be a pig anymore. You'll be a child of the king who is able to start perfecting his holiness in you by the Holy Spirit he puts inside of you to make you born again. So your prayer can be as simple as this. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every, every Christian, please pray. But if you're not yet saved, will you pray this with me? Dear God, I need forgiveness. My deepest problem is unpardoned sin. And today I've heard how Jesus died for my sins. Even before I requested salvation from my sins, he died for my sins. He died to give forgiveness for my sins, and I believe that today. I believe everything the Bible has told me. So make me your child, put me in Christ, and put the Holy Ghost inside of me. I embrace grace by faith in the good news of the gospel. For I ask it in Jesus' precious name, amen.